Okay. So, uh, last but not least for this session, we have uh, Judith Tyner's paper, um, as read by Katie Parker. Uh, Judith Tyner is Professor Emerita at California State University, Long Beach, uh, where she taught for 37 years. She received her PhD in 1974 from the Geography Department of UCLA. Uh, Tyner is the author of four textbooks on map reading and map design, uh, and a book on needlework, maps, and globes called uh, Stitching the World, Embroidered Maps in Women's Geographical Education. Uh, she has written over 40 scholarly uh, articles on a wide range of cartographic subjects, including lunar cartography, persuasive cartography, uh, history of atlases, uh, cloth maps, and women in cartography. She is currently compl uh, completing a book on the history of American women in cartography uh, that will uh, that will be published uh, in late uh, 2019 and includes a lot of images uh, from the David Ramsey map collection. Um, I should also mention. Um, uh, that uh, the, there's this other program, um, one of several that we run, that the center runs, and uh, we partner with the California Map Society, um, and it's the uh, the annual essay competition for students. Uh, it has a prize of a thousand dollars. We are very fortunate uh, to have Judith Tyner uh, be one of the three judges. Um, she has been for the last three years, and she will continue to this uh, this coming year. Um, and so I want to thank her for that. Um, so uh, without further ado, here is Judith Tyner's paper titled Three Women Pictorial Cartographers, A Study in Contrasts, as read and presented by Katie Parker. All right, I did not prepare this PowerPoint, so if I skip a slide or have to toggle back, I apologize to Judith and I apologize to all of you as well. And just another footnote before I start, Judith did write this in the first person. Um, I have changed, I think, all of them to the third person, because I don't want to say I for Judith. Um, but if I mess up and there's one I in there, know that it's Judith and not me interjecting something in the middle of this. All right. So over the past 20 years, Judith has been exploring maps made by women. Alice Hudson and Mary Ritzland paved the way by recreating lists of women involved in the map trades, primarily in the pre-20th century. The impression has been that women in the map-making fields were marginal and that, they did perf and that they performed menial tasks. This is true to some extent, but it was also the case for the rank and file of men to do so. Many of the men were, also, were, were anonymous. In the court of Judas Wishart, she has found pedagogues such as Emma Willard, who was discussed by Susan Shulton, independent women such as Laura Whitlock, who was the official cartographer for the city of Los Angeles in 1908, Scientists such as Marie Tharp and Irene Fisher, discussed by Pat Seed. Travelers and persuaders, as Chris Dando found in the progressive area. As well as women who were creating maps during World War II, women who worked for cartographic firms, and academics who not only made maps, but studied and analyzed them. Today, Judith is going to talk, well, Judith talked and I'm writing about, about three women who were creators of pictorial maps in the early to mid 20th century. We are all aware that until quite recently, there has been little written about women in cartography. There's, this is also the case for pictorial mapping. Pictorial mapping has been ignored by and large by the history of cartography community because of the scientific bias. Pictorial maps by their very nature have not been considered real maps. This is beginning to change with works by Stephen Hornsby and Dory Griffin, and with collections such as the Rumsey Collection with over 2,000 maps viewable online, and the PJ Mode Collection of Persuasive Maps at Cornell. Pictures on maps go back for centuries, where, quote, geographers on Afric maps with savage pictures filled their gaps, as Jonathan Swift described in his satirical poem. But the maps usually designated as pictorial are largely a product of the 20th century and were quite popular in the early part of that century. Stephen Hornsby in Picturing America considers the time from 1920 to 1960 to be the golden age of pictorial cartography in America. The increase in automobile tourism, air travel, and inexpensive lithography that reduced the cost of color printing all contributed to the rise of the form. Because many of the maps were designed for advertising and tourism, they were often considered ephemeral or throwaway maps, and they're found in brochures, magazines, postcards, and even as placemats. 
In many cases, pictorial maps are treated as a singular style, as though they were all quite similar in appearance. This is not the case, however. Depending on the function of the map, persuasion, educational, narrative, and the place of publication, the maps can range from cartoonish to decorative. In fact, Judith has not found a consistent definition or term for a pictorial map. Bird's eye view maps, antique maps with sailing ships and sea serpents, and cartoon maps have all been labeled as pictorial. Terms have included popular cartography, illustrative cartography, and cartographs, among others. The maps may include amusing elements or be virtual works of art, as in Burns' map from Marie Sharp's research, Tharp's research, which we just heard about. Today we will see three styles of maps consider, considered as pictorial in the 20th century. Although Alice Hudson and Mary Ritzland have done exhaustive work on finding pre-20th century women cartographers, not as much work has been done for women of the 20th century. Obviously, the two other women on this panel are exceptions. <laughs> In large part, the issue has been that women are hard to find. Many 20th century women worked for government agencies and private mapping companies as part of a team, and as such, their names are not found on maps. Erwin Royce noted in 1937, quote, it is rather unfortunate that maps are often named after the person who did the least work on them, such as the publisher or the chief of the survey. This is especially true in more modern times when, with the increasing complexity of maps, the work of the individual can scarcely be distinguished, and the name attached to a map or an atlas serves more for the designation of the map than to identify with production to a particular person." End quote. Alice Hudson noted the difficulty of finding women specifically, and that they were uncovered largely by accident. Avril Madrill compared research on women to an archaeological dig. Pictorial maps, however, are usually an individual production, and thus the cartographer or artist places his or her name on the map. As a result, Judith has been able to identify over 50 American women pictorial map makers. The majority of these women had their training in art, not in cartography or geography. Judith chose the three women that she's going to discuss today on the basis of their contra contrasting goals and styles and the periods in which they worked. First, we have Ruth Taylor White. Ruth Taylor White, who more commonly signed her name as Ruth Taylor, was one of the most prolific of pictorial mapmakers. Taylor attended Stanford University as an English major, but while there she did freelance illustrations for Stanford publications and advertisements for local businesses and some commercial cartoons. In 1919, she left Stanford to study art at the New York Institute of Art and Design. She married and moved to Arizona, where her first pictorial map was made of the Grand Canyon in 1929, for a book titled Grand Canyon Country, written by Minor Tillotson and her brother, Frank Taylor. She coined the term cartograph for her style of maps. She also illustrated a number of books. The best known was O Ranger about the national parks in 1929. Her brother, Frank Taylor, wrote the text, and Ruth created illustrations in what had become her signature cartoonish style. The book is now available online through the National Park Service, and the National Park Service also now has an app titled O-Ranger. The Hawaii Tourist Bureau saw her work and hired her to make a series of maps on the territory and sent her on a two-month research trip. I would like to do that. <laughs> the maps she made were used as promotional maps for the Bureau. These led to the publication in 1935 of what is probably her best known work, Our USA, A Gay Geography, that was commissioned by Little, Brown, and Company. It is usually described as a children's atlas. The text was again by her brother Frank and maps by Ruth. There is a US map and then separate maps for each state and territory. The maps show the economic activities and the people of each state and region. It was very well reviewed at the time and judged amusing and informative by contemporary writings. The New York Times described the maps as accurate, but funny. However, the maps are actually quite disturbing and even offensive by modern standards. Because of the cartoon style of the drawing, the people shown are stereotypical racial caricatures, and this is especially notable for African Americans who are shown picking cotton and eating watermelon with large, happy smiles. And we can see that. Okay. Um, on the map of Tennessee, 
uh, there's lots of racism. There's a drawing of a Ku Klux Klansman in hood and robe holding a pistol standing next to a bucket of tar. Taylor was not the only pictorial cartographer to use such stereotypes. And if you haven't been outraged enough yet, it's right, it's right there. So there's the tar, there's that. Next to mule raising. Pointer down. Indeed it was. Uh, okay, so let's go on to a different cartographer. <laughs> Louise Jefferson. Uh, so this, this will make us all feel slightly better. Time-wise, Louise Jefferson's work somewhat overlaps with Ruth Taylor's, but her maps are quite different. Louise Jefferson was an African-American woman whose primary work was in the 1940s. Jefferson's father was a calligrapher for the U.S. Treasury, who taught her drawing and calligraphy as a child. She later studied art at Howard University in Washington, D.C., and Hunter College in New York. She also attended Columbia University, where she studied graphic arts. Early in her career, around 1936, she illustrated a book called We Sing America, often described as a songbook, but it's actually about the African-American experience in America. It talks about children of both races going to school together and has illustrations of black and white children playing together. The book was banned by the governor of Georgia, Eugene Talmadge, who ordered it burned. Jefferson became affiliated with the Friendship Press that was sponsored by the National Council of Churches, and she ultimately became director of that press in 1942. Probably her most famous pictorial map, which we have back there, along with a gay geography um, illustration, which was published um, in 1946 by the Friendship Press, is Americans of Negro Lineage. This was a detailed map that celebrated the accomplishments of African Americans in all fields. Two years earlier, she made a map of Native Americans titled Indians of the United States. The map shows locations of the various tribes and also shows the tribes that were relocated to Oklahoma in the Trail of Tears. The map of China, um, she also created maps of Africa and China, and we have the map of China was made in 1948, a year after the Communist Revolution. The map of China shows distribution of agricultural products and activities in various areas. While she showed people on her maps, as did Taylor, they are not as cartoonish and they are certainly less blatantly stereotypical. Her maps are intended to be educational, and the African-American map has, in addition to famous people, an inset map showing Negro population by state. It is not a chloropleth map, but essentially a spatial arrangement of statistics. She also made conventional maps, and in 1972, Roden illustrated a book, The Decorative Arts of Africa, which included four maps, of which here we have two. And finally, our last cartographer today, our third pictorial cartographer was Alva Scott Garfield. Garfield was a New Englander whose best known maps are a series of pictorial maps of New England, um, New England places made in the 1950s. She was born Alva Scott and married James Mitchell, whom she divorced, and later married Mason Garfield, who died three years later. Thus, she is sometimes referred to as Alva Scott Mitchell and sometimes as Alva Scott Garfield. As an aside, this illustrates one of the more frustrating problems in researching women in the field in the 20th century is the multiple names that often exist for one person, making it hard to track them. Alva was an arts graduate of Wellesley and later did some graduate work at Radcliffe. Her first pictorial map was a map of Wellesley titled The New Map of Wellesley, copyrighted in 1926. Three years later, she collaborated on a similar map of the campus of Wheaton College. After a gap of 25 years, she began making maps again, and published a Scott map of Harvard University and of Radcliffe College, Cambridge, Massachusetts, in 1959. During the 1950s and early 60s, she created a series of individual pictorial maps of New England called Scott Maps. The title cartouches of these maps say, A Scott Map of, designed and drawn by Alva Scott Garfield, published by Scott Maps. The Scott maps are quite different from those of Ruth Taylor and of Louise Jefferson. They're basically tourist maps of small places, not countries and states. And there is more focus on landmarks than of people. There is also some humor on the maps. And we'll see um, that in just a moment. This is the Boston map, which we also have in the case back there. And on the Boston map, for example, there's a border that alternates pictures of bean pots and codfish, with the codfish each having different comic expressions as a reference to Boston as, quote, the home of the beans and the cod, end quote. The Boston verse is part of the cartouche, which we can see over there. Some of her humor is quite sly. Um, this is hilarious. For example, on her map of Salem, 
which focuses on history, ships, and landmarks, such as the house where Hawthorne wrote the House of Seven Gables, she has a drawing of a witch on a flying broomstick with a black cat as a passenger, and notes that Salem was where aviation began. Salem, of course, was home to the infamous witch trials in the 17th century. She also includes mermaids in the North River. And actually, if you notice where it is here, so aviation started in Salem, and then here we have a powering guy and it says, uh, the anti-aircraft is surprised. Uh, and then we have here Hester Prynne and Little Pearl, and Hester was the first to get her letter. And then we have our mermaids over here. And importantly, I think, uh, we here have some Native Americans represented with teepees, which wouldn't be true of the area, but that's fine. Uh, but it says first families of the area there, which is very different than representations we saw with our first cartographer. Okay. Uh, her map of the White Mountains of New Hampshire is definitely aimed at tourists showing inns and activities. Tourists are shown playing tennis, swimming, fishing, skiing, sledding, and ice skating, including a place, indicating a place that is meant for all seasons. She sold her maps either mounted for three fifty or unmounted for a dollar, and advertised them in magazines which would explain that the maps weren't throwaways but in souvenirs intended for keeping. Because these women did not work for a government agency or a commercial map company, they did not have to conform to agency or company standards and were free to employ their own styles. Indeed, it seems that Scott employed herself with these maps called Scott maps. They weren't restricted to abstract symbols, but could utilize drawings of people, buildings, and landforms. They were not limited by scale and planimetric view, so they could exaggerate. Because they don't make real maps, they could also include humor and some of their own personality. I chose, Judith chose, these three women because of their contrasting styles and goals. I, she believes, dang it, she believes it is a mistake to lump together all maps of a type as though there is uniformity in style and purpose. It is also a mistake to lump together all maps made by women as though there were a feminine style of map making. With the exception of maps created by a company such as Rand McNally or government agencies such as the USGS, where there is a specific style guide, maps by individuals exhibit an individual artist's style. And that is what she had. Thank you. All right, so we do have time for a few questions if people had them, and I'm sure our speakers would like to hear. And if you want to, um, respond to Judith, you can either tell me or Salim and we can send those to her or she has included her email address here and she's indicated she would love to hear from people um, about the work she's doing uh, and the larger book she is working on is, is a much larger history, not just of the 20th century. So, On the Hull House maps, I was curious, I didn't see the color coding. What are the, what do they represent, different colors? Okay, so um, this is the Hull House Nationalities map. So um, this is um, Hull House uh, and Jane Addams were inspired by um, Booth's maps of London poverty. Lon London, the London poverty maps were done on a uh, block by block basis and were color coded with brighter colors indicating higher socioeconomic levels and darker colors indicating lower. Hull House is unique in that they um, they did it on a tenement building basis and broke it down within the tenement building itself. And in this case, it's the nationalities map, so they're telling us what the nationality is within each tenement building. So this neighborhood is the neighborhood to the southeast of Hull House. It is very close to the uh, stockyards in Chicago and was, of course, a huge immigrant neighborhood. And so. Uh, the green is Irish, the purple is German, the purple lines is Dutch, red is Russian, red stripes Polish, a blue Italian, blue stripes, and so they break it down and tell you what the ethnicities were within each building. No African-Americans? No, they're, 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 they're absolute, well. No, no, I'll bring it down. Let's see if we can pull I it down. Move it up. Well, yeah, and yeah, there's, there's some interesting things. And so like, there's English, but Irish are separate, <laughs> you know? Yeah, there we go. 
there we go. So yeah, English speakers, which, which excludes the Irish, because the Irish are then in green. Um, let's see. Yes, they have colored in the black, of course. Um, yeah, but this was not a, a black neighborhood. The, what they called the Black Belt in Chicago was in a different area. Okay. Other questions? Susan Sus Schultz. Um, just some kind of half-baked observations that connect uh, Patsy's paper with, didn't early on Judith have the Atlantic Ridge map as a kind yep, of pictorial? Mm -hmm. Right. So just as a matter of clarification, and it's up here, as Patsy pointed out, when Tharp and Heason put that together in the 1950s, it looks very different. So since we're being careful about who does what, that's actually executed by Heinrich Baran an artist. So it's important to separate that out. But even to me, more interesting and important is that when Marie Tharp is putting together the data and notices the ridge, right, part of what she's trying to do is to speculate and create a concept that will, as Patsy said, later be validated. So it's this wonderful example of the map as a hypothesis, which I think is just such a, um, her contribution in that sense was just so remarkable. So. Um, yeah, a actually, that's that's a little bit incorrect. The day this is data, not data is from. It's not data from the 1950s. It's from the data is from the 1960s. Uh, she started work at Domont Laboratory uh, in 1948, um, and that map is the first major map um, that's produced. And I don't give um, credit to the painter you're talking about. Um, the painter uh, is Austrian and I believe Nazi, and I'm not going to use the name of a Nazi painter on a map on a discussion where I'm also talking about Irene Fisher and the 12 uh, mathematicians and scientists that the Nazis murdered. Do we have other questions? In the back. I just have a question about the Daughters of the American Revolution mapping. I thought that was really interesting. And they're building a ton of monuments at the same exact time. So I just thought the timing of the mid 20th century with those maps was really interesting because if you, especially if you travel around New England, there are all kinds of DAR memorials to different events and different people that are right at the same time that they're making these maps. I'm curious if you know if they were linked in any way. Um, well, the big thing with the Dar was that they were they were encouraging these descendants to celebrate American history, and for the, the those those women in the American West, they weren't they didn't have landscapes of the Revolutionary War to celebrate. So it took them a little bit to figure out to celebrate the American frontier, and Kansas was really the earliest to start that process. So Kansas started first. Missouri came slightly later once they saw what Kansas was doing. Um, so it, there's a little bit of a ripple effect in terms of the timing. So it wasn't completely simultaneously, but again, it's part of the larger DAR, which began, what, 1890-ish, I believe. So you know, it took, it took those, those in the West a little bit longer to figure out, and then they started copying each other and rifting off each other and literally building off each other. But it is like a national agenda. Absolutely, yes. Right, but again, and again, again, there's no American Revolution to map in the West. You know, they were they were beyond the landscape of the Revolutionary War. I mean, the furthest West battle was Vincennes, wasn't it, Indiana? So, but it it, it is kind of creative history making. It that is. They are called the Daughters of the American Revolution, and they're kind of racking their brains for how to participate. And so then they. But it's shocking to things. realize that they were losing the history of the frontier so quickly. Yeah. So quickly, yeah. Well, when you build in sod, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't stick around. <laughs> Other questions? Are you working on one? Sure. Um, I, uh, I was a contemporary of Judith at UCLA in the 60s. And the comment I really want to make is that map making and surveying and this world database that we have been generating over the eons, really, 
is by its nature a collaborative event. I remember at UCLA in the 60s, it was an up-and-coming department of geography, but I know the women in the department were often uh, shuttled into cartography with the assumption that they would be uh, very good draftspersons to make the maps that the various professors uh, were doing for their and this was, I'm pretty sure, true, although she graduated later than I did. Uh, but I knew many women that, in fact, were put in that category. And it's, it's nothing new. Everybody in this room knows that if you go back to the time of 1960, 1950, well into the 70s, it was such a dominated world by the top professors who were virtually all men that no surprise that women were usually not mentioned at all. But I think we have to owe a great debt to people like Judith, who was able to also, with the help of a very wonderful professor, a Norman Thrower, that allowed her to rise to the standards that she has. And I'm sorry that Judith cannot be here, and I wish her a quick recovery from whatever uh, health issues have kept her in Los Angeles. Thank you. We do too. I have a question for Judith Tyner that I'm hoping someone here can answer <laughs> um, on that note. Um, does anyone know, did she actually coin the term persuasive map? Could Judith? Yeah. No. Okay. I was just curious because um, does anyone know who coined that term? No. <laughs> She may have coined the term. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. It's because she listed all those terms that. But she didn't yeah. put persuasive. But. Um, she her article on persuasive mapping. Well, in the seventies. Was that nineteen seventies? Six. Yeah. That that she she did. So she she might have that we will ask her and if because she did we will I give just her want, all the credit. On that <laughs> note, I wanted to say it's it's dealers and collectors who've claimed the term for their own, mm -hmm. but I think she she initially Probably. came up with it. Mm -hmm. mm. I like my, that. Yes, my let's go with that. Yes. <laughs> yep. Well, Excellent. So go. we are giving it to her. Yeah. All right. <laughs> very good observation. And I just want to close that I think what um, Judith ended her paper with is a very important observation as a check on scholars that are working specifically on women's history. Um, it becomes very easy when you are trying to resurrect and give recognition to a group that has been historically discriminated against and written out of history to then somehow construct this more kind of idea that this was women's work and this is what women's work looks like. So I really like that all our speakers and especially Judith towards the end of her paper said that this isn't a feminine style. Mm -hmm. Each of these styles of these women were absolutely their own and individualistic just like every man has his own style and that they were very brave to be able to be represented and um, saved by history with with the maps they've left behind so with that I'd like to thank our speakers and Judith and absentia one more time and thank you Katie for speaking for Judith no problem. You did a fabulous Judith <laughs>